so we are on day 3 module 3 of understanding mechanical ventilator ventilation in the elevate ventilator management experience webinar series first half uh, i'll deal with uh, how to manage weaning from mechanical ventilation and uh, something more about ventilating copd patients mechanical ventilation we are all familiar with how to initiate right from the time of intubation how to do the pre-use check then you proceed to the stabilization phase and once stabilization is done you start with the readiness testing for extubation so you don't want your patient to be on mechanical ventilation indefinitely that is just to keep the physiology going to support the systems as soon as possible you try to take off that uh, invasive mode of um, health support system okay so after initiation stabilization phase stabilization phase second half starts the uh, all important part of readiness testing and uh, which ultimately should culminate in extubation in the best of care scenario so weaning is a form of uh, art and uh, it is the science of liberation too in intensive care practice we take care of a b c d e f bundle pain management is definitely there spontaneous awakening trial and spontaneous breathing trials are uh, there which we will discuss further choice of analgesia sedation delirium management early mobilization of course family engagement and empowerment everything taken together will produce a good package of intensive care management especially when mechanical ventilation is involved as i said before we need to focus on the patient and his problems rather than focusing much on the sophistications of mechanical ventilation the mechanical ventilation sophistication modes alarms everything is for your help in assisting the patient recovering from his pathology how do you assess the readiness to wean first the reversal of the indication for ventilatory support there should be good enough uh, reasons to believe so the gas exchange should be adequate with the indicators like uh, good pao2 uh, reduction in fio2 or oxygen requirement reduction in peep requirement the ph coming close to the physiological one vd by vt less than 60 percent patient not hyperventilating etc definitely patient should be hemodynamically stable also there should be minimal cardiovascular support no evidence of cardiac ischemia ongoing no unstable arrhythmias and patient when he starts to initiate breath you should be preparing yourself to assess the readiness to wean it is said that uh, more than 40 percent of the time on mechanical ventilation is spent on weaning the patient from mechanical ventilation what are the weaning parameters these are used to predict the weaning readiness okay you assess for uh, three major categories you assess the ventilatory drive ventilatory muscle capabilities ventilator ventilatory performance ventilatory drive is assessed by the value called p01 don't get scared it is the value given in modern and um, uh, mechanical ventilators should be more than minus four centimeters of water it is the airway occlusion pressure during the first 0.1 second after beginning an inspiratory effort against an occluded airway so that is the checking of ventilatory drive then something about ventilatory muscle capabilities when the vital capacity is more than 10 ml per kg minimum inspiratory pressure mip or nif less than minus 30 centimeters of water ventilatory performance indicators like mint ventilation less than 10 liters per minute maximum voluntary ventilation more than three times the minute ventilation rapid shallow breathing index or risk b less than 105 and respiratory rate less than 30 per minute 
How do you do spontaneous awakening trial? It starts with a safety screen. You have to roll out the contraindications like uh, seizures, alcohol withdrawal, raised ICP, moribund status, waiting for withdrawal of life support, cardiovascular system, you check for shock, high requirement of pressures, myocardial ischemia within the last 24 hours, or if the patient is on post-cardiac arrest hypothermia protocol, you can't go for spontaneous awakening trial. With regard to respiratory system, if patient is ventilator dependent, you cannot uh, opt for spontaneous awakening trial. So it's the case with uh, ongoing neuromuscular blockers used. There should be a checklist. Neurologically, you check whether the patient opens his eyes, looks at the caregiver, squeezes or his hands, or put out the tongue. Three out of four would be very much desirable. And then you check the objective indicators like um, saturation more than 88% on an FAO2, less than 50% and a PEEP less than eight centimeters of water. Spontaneous effort in the last five minutes period, no evidence of myocardial ischemia in the previous 24 hours, no significant use of vasopressors, no agitation, no evidence of raised ICP. So there should be a protocol. Most of the um, ICUs will have a protocol to perform this. The inclusion criteria being presence of spontaneous breathing, no planned procedures, no ventilator dependence, and the pain scores acceptable. If everything is yes, then check for the screening criteria. Saturation more than 88% on FAO2 less than 50%, PEEP less than, PEEP requirement less than eight centimeters of water. Patient should be hemodynamically stable and uh, rhythm should be stable. If yes, conduct a one minute uh, screening for a spontaneous breathing trial. Check whether uh, RSBA remains less than 105 and respiratory rate is less than 35. If it clears that one minute check, you can proceed with a spontaneous breathing trial for a minimum period of 30 minutes to a maximum period of 120 minutes or two hours. If it is a short period of ventilation, 30 minutes of SBT should suffice. If it is a longer period, you need a longer uh, trial period to see whether even off the ventilator support, patient will maintain the oxygenation, ventilation, and airway protection. Okay, so if that is cleared, that means uh, RSBA does not exceed 105 for uh, five minutes. Saturation is not dropping below 90% for more than two minutes. No arrhythmia. Heart rate stays uh, less than 140% or 20% increase in baseline. You can declare as uh, SBT passed. If SBT is passed, then uh, you can uh, check for the secretions, positive airway leak test, the cuff leak test you can perform, which is not 100% uh, conclusive though. Then record the results and uh, multidisciplinary team decision. We can proceed with the extubation if the spontaneous breathing trial is successful. How do you do spontaneous breathing uh, trial? It is a mechanism used to assess the patient's ability to breathe with minimal or no ventilatory support. Original um, option was a TPS trial where humidified oxygen was connected directly to ET2 along the TPS. Other options are when the patient is still connected to the ventilator through the circuit, you can do a CPAP trial with the CPAP level equal to the current PEEP level or you can provide a low level of pressure support or you can go for automatic tube compensation. Okay, the advantage is since the patient is attached to the ventilator, you can maintain the precise FiO2 and in case the patient fails the trial, they can be quickly placed back on the full vent uh, ventilatory support or uh, you can set backup mode uh, settings. Along with the weaning, you need to be uh, vigilant about uh, what sedation analgesia is going on. You should be familiar with the common uh, drugs used for uh, sedation analgesia in the ICU. You should be familiar with the elimination half-life, whether it is affected by renal or liver dysfunction. And uh, is there any possibility of active metabolites accumulating? That also you need to consider before deciding finally on extubation. Pharmacological weaning plan, it's important 
that uh, sedation scoring and ventilator mechanics both are taken into account and uh, there should be a caution about polypharmacy and uh, SOS or as needed dosing which might interfere with your plan for uh, spontaneous awakening trial or SBT. Patients awaiting and uh, spontaneous awakening trial uh, failing an SAT can uh, you can restart sedatives at the half the previous dose and then titrate for comfort depending on which sedation score you are using in your ICU. Now we'll discuss uh, the ventilatory strategies and some um, technical things regarding ventilating a case of COPD. I think the best option to uh, give these messages would be through a story. Okay, Kahani Sunao that uh, everybody would like to hear the story. So this is a sample story. A 72 year old gentleman who was a chronic smoker is admitted with acute exacerbation of COPD and uh, he is obtended with the CO2 narcosis, respiratory failure. He was intubated in the emergency room and shifted to ICU for ventilation. The question is how are you going to keep his ventilator settings? So before going uh, something about uh, COPD, we should know what is happening in uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. It's characterized by persistent respiratory symptoms and airflow limitation that is due to airway, anbar or alveolar abnormalities usually caused by significant exposure to noxious particles or gases. It also produces significant systemic consequences. I think last time Q&A session there was a question whether uh, asthma ventilation is same as COPD ventilation. COPD ventilation is not 100% reversible uh, pathological condition we are dealing with. There is definitely um, uh, respiratory membrane destruction, alveolar destruction. So with each exacerbation, patient's reserve is going to come back and uh, patients are likely on medications for a long time, for years altogether. So the components of COPD include inflammation and airflow limitation. It can be uh, presented with a small airways disease or parenchymal destruction, which is uh, detrimental for uh, gas exchange and the outcome. There may be damaged airways. It can collapse easily. There will be a loss of elasticity and uh, reduced force to push air out. That's why patients are training during exhalation. So the key culprits, bronchospasm, airway mucus collection and inflammation can cause uh, raised uh, or increased res airway resistance and uh, reduced elastic recoil. The increased airway resistance will lead to expiratory flow limitation and changes in FRC and inspiratory capacity, which we'll discuss now. Elastic recoil reduction will lead to trapped volume, that is inadequate exhalation, leading to autopeep, which will cause dynamic hyperinflation which will result in diaphragm flattening, increased vocal breathing and ineffective respiratory pump. Ultimately this all will lead on to respiratory failure, inadequate tidal volumes and uh, increased alveolar uh, arterial CO2 and uh, impending alt uh, altered sensorium respiratory failure and uh, the story goes on like this. Just to understand the basics, what is happening, just I would like to remind you about the relevant lung volumes. This is the normal tidal volume and after the normal exhalation, what is remaining is functional residual capacity. So after a normal exhalation, how much you can inhale to the total lung capacity is the inspiratory capacity. Okay. So what happens with the continuous or persistent airflow limit, expiratory airflow limitation is, you can see the airflow limitation happening. The FRC gradually goes up with years of this pathology. And it almost touches the um, base of the exhalation. Okay, so now from here, if somebody can exhale this much is the inspiratory capacity from this particular new elevated baseline, they cannot breathe more. To understand how it feels, you can take a deep breath, hold, and then try to take another breath over it. You'll realize how difficult it is. 
that's what these unfortunate people are suffering throughout the uh, latter half or later decades of their life okay and uh, when the frc is increased actually the diaphragmatic dynamics mechanics are uh, lost the curvature is flattened so there is not much of uh, allowance to contract or uh, uh, reduce the curvature further so that is the problem with the persistent um, auto peep formation and the destruction of the respiratory units it all leads to will lead to inefficient breathing raised co2 which will lead to raised the respiratory drive and patient will be agitated and restless Autopip, I have explained in the last uh, session as well. We'll see how this uh, autopip works in a COPD patient. So first one I'm showing is a normal patient without any um, inadequate exhalation. At the end of expiration, the alveolar pressure comes back to atmospheric pressure. Airway pressure is also zero, which is in continuity with the atmosphere. And the pleural pressure is also zero. So there is no airflow happening at the end of expiration. I request all the um, um, residents and the junior friends to listen to this part very carefully. Then you will have a better insight into COPD ventilation. So what happens during inspiration, when the inspiratory muscles contract, develop pleural pressure of maybe minus five, the alveolar pressure becomes minus five, which is much less than the airway pressure or the atmospheric pressure so there is a gradient from 0 to minus 5 and there is gas flow in the inspiratory flow happens okay there is not much of extra effort fine now imagine a situation where there is air trapping and due to this air trapping it develops an auto peep of 10 centimeters of water this is for your understanding so when the alveolar pressure is 10, okay, some of it is being transmitted to the pleural pressure, maybe 30% of it, we can take it as plus 3. This happens at the end of exhalation. Okay, so at the mouth opening pressure, atmosphere pressure is 0, here it is 10, there is no airflow happening because of the collapse of the airway. Okay, now active inspiration starts. Now, what happens is when the active inspiration start the pleural pressure becomes goes negative from plus 3 to 0 and um, up to minus 13 it has to go to make the alveolar pressure minus 3 okay so only when this much effort is exerted there is a gradient developing between the ambient pressure and the alveolar pressure unless the alveolar pressure is less than the ambient pressure inspiratory flow doesn't happen so this is the change in work you see when there is an auto peep when there is an auto peep developing the patient will have to exert major work of breathing to inhale or to have inspiratory flow happening now imagine a case this is the copd patient he has got auto peep now you are going to ventilate him and you are going to give a play peep external peep onto his breathing circuit that means now he is breathing from a different atmosphere where the baseline pressure itself is 10 centimeters of water so at the end of expiration the baseline pressure is 10 the alveolar pressure is plus 10 like here there is no gas flow happening fine and when the inspiratory effort starts say pleural pressure of minus 3 this alveolar pressure drops by 3 from 10 it becomes 7 now there is a gradient okay from 10 to 7 there is a gradient and inspiratory flow will happen with much minimal work of breathing that is the advantage you are giving by applying the external peak in physiological condition or uh, normal conditions you have seen COPD patients pursing their lips this is basically to create a positive end expiratory pressure so that 
the inspiratory flow starts with the lesser amount of work of breathing otherwise they'll tire out and go in for respiratory failure this is another diagram to understand that here we can see the alveolar pressure as plus 8 the pleural pressure is also plus 8 and the ambient pressure is zero or the atmospheric pressure and there is an airway collapse preventing the release of uh, remaining part of alveolar gas into the atmosphere this happens at the end of expiration now beginning of inspiration there is an inspiratory effort the pleural pressure has become minus 8 and with lots of effort this alveolar pressure has come down to zero is there any inspiratory flow at this point no flow happens because there is no gradient existing from the atmospheric pressure to the alveolar pressure and now if you exert a little bit more maybe if you can generate minus one alveolar pressure with additional effort you can create a gradient and then the flow begins so to begin the inspiratory flow itself it requires a significant amount of work of breathing in case of auto peep development now i am going to apply a plus six peep extrinsic peep to this system you can see at the end of expiration the alveolar pressure is eight the outside pressure is plus six that is the end expiratory pressure is plus six because of the alveolar uh, the airway collapse there is no gas flow occurring now beginning of inspiration with the minimal effort minus two plural pressure plus eight becomes plus six and now there is a gradient from plus six to uh, okay sorry uh, up to plus six there is no gradient and no inspiratory flow happens and little bit more effort it becomes plus eight becomes plus five now there is a gradient and then flow begins so you don't need to have that much huge effort to begin the inspiratory flow when you have an extrinsic peep applied now the question is whether the peep is going to be helpful or counterproductive we have all learned that application of peep will keep the um, airways open because of the positive end expiratory pressure does it happen like this will it uh, obstruct uh, the exhalation for that concept you can see this uh, waterfall principle in the previous example the alveolar pressure was plus 10 critical pressure may be around plus 6 and the airway pressure of zero and this is the waterfall happening now the application of peep will gradually elevate this baseline from zero to plus one plus two plus three up to plus six up to something less than plus six this water flow uh, waterfall flow will keep on continuing that means application of extrinsic peep less than the critical pressure is not going to affect the emptying at all instead on the other hand actually once this baseline is elevated it helps the work of breathing for your next inspiratory effort so in nutshell when you diagnose possibility of auto peep or intrinsic peep you should apply external peep around 50 to 80 percent of the intrinsic peep so that uh, the inspiratory uh, flow work of breathing will be significantly reduced here you can see the amount of flow over the waterfall remains constant until the level of uh, uh, in the stream below that is the airway pressure and reaches the height of what waterfall like uh, when the airway pressure reaches this height up to this point the flow will not be hampered the release of the water flow will keep on happening whether it is from this pressure to this pressure or this pressure to here it will keep on happening there is no problem with the flow at all but for the next inspiratory effort it helps a lot okay how do you estimate the intrinsic peep first if the patient is passive you can reduce the peep to zero before me measuring auto peep and then you do an expiratory hole for 
few seconds one or two seconds now you can see the baseline getting elevated so whatever positive pressure measured at this point of time is caused by the dynamic hyperinflation or inadequate acceleration and this is the intrinsic peep clear so this can be done only on passive patients and you reduce peep to zero and then give ex expiratory hold whatever positive pressure you measure is auto peep newer ventilators will calculate the total peep measured and uh, total peep minus applied peep also gives an idea regarding the possibility of inadequate exhalation in clinically how do you estimate there will be missed trigger efforts so clinically you can just rely on unexplained tachycardia hypotension or clinical observation of active expiration or vesas that continue to the onset of inspiration the effects will be hemodynamic problems increased work of breathing and the trigger will have to cross the auto peep level before inspiration is initiated so the missed breaths will cause wasted breath so this is what happens without auto peep from the baseline minus one centimeter of water if that is the trigger set once it reaches minus one an assisted breath is initiated and the patient gets a breath but here there is an auto peep developing almost say for, for example five centimeters of water there is a trigger maybe much more than minus one but it is not touching the baseline so that effort trigger is not getting answered so after some time patient again takes a deeper trigger inspiration inspiratory effort it goes to minus one below this new baseline that means 5 plus 1 6 now that new trigger has become minus 6 so patient will have to give that much inspiratory effort to get an assisted breath this is how auto uh, peep results in increased effective trigger value and uh, if the trigger is not reaching that level it becomes wasted work what are the factors affecting intrinsic peep it will be minute ventilation ie ratio expiratory time constant again i request my uh, junior friends and uh, residents to watch this uh, explanation very carefully you would think that uh, if you want to wash out uh, co2 you increase the minute ventilation that's what uh, majority of people do okay for our patient i have set um, uh, assist volume control mode fao to 40 percent tidal volume of 400 rate of 10 IA ratio of 1 is to 2, PEEP of 5. I get an ABG done. ABG shows a pH of 7.28, PAO2 of 70, which is okay. PCO2 of 72, which looks slightly increased, no? not acceptable. So what to do? So my friend uh, said, uh, you go up on uh, mint ventilation. Mint ventilation is tidal volume into rate. So increase the tidal volume to 500 increase the rate to 15 breaths per minute and he leaves the case two hours later i did an abg which showed a ph worsening to 7.18 pco2 also worsening to 82 from the initial 72. now how do we explain this change we have increased the minute ventilation but the pco2 has increased we'll take the first example first case we had a minute ventilation of 400 into 10 is 4000 ml the respiratory rate was set as uh, 10 breaths per minute so one cycle time is six seconds i have set an ie ratio of one is to two so two seconds for inspiration four seconds for exhalation which means to exhale the 400 ml i pushed in with the ippv you are giving four seconds to come out okay now what happens uh, when the mint ventilation was increased now in the second case the minute ventilation is 500 into 15 that is 7.5 liters the respiratory rate now is 15 so one cycle time is 60 by 50 is 4 seconds 1 is to 2 ie ratio that means inspiratory time of 1.33 seconds and expiratory time of 2.66 seconds so what's the change in nutshell 
we are giving 2.66 seconds for the, the pushed in 500 ml to come out. Initially, we were giving 4 seconds for 400 ml to come out. But now with the increased main ventilation, the second set of setting, we are giving much lesser time for a higher volume to come out. That is why CO2 increases. So this is what happens. Initially 400 ml, 10 tidal volume, 1 is to 2 AE ratio. The dead space was around uh, 2 ml per kg. We gave 4 seconds to, for it to come out. If we just increase the respiratory rate, we are giving lesser time, 2.6 seconds for 400 ml to come out. But again, the physiological dead space has gone to 3 ml per kg. Again, the second setting, 500 ml tidal volume, 15 rate you are giving 2.6 seconds for 500 ml to be exhaled, effectively increasing the dead space to 4 ml per kg. Again, you can see the capillaries are getting compressed. So pulmonary vascular resistance is increasing and core pulmonary will develop with this change. There is another example where uh, I set uh, again on volume control, assist, uh, volume control mode, FAO to 40% tidal volume, 420 ml. Respiratory rate 15 breaths per minute and I kept uh, more in expiratory rate time 1 is to 3 and peep of 5. The peak pressure goes to 43. Again, I read on the monitor the compliance is 50 ml per uh, centimeters of water. Resistance is 30 centimeters of water per liter per second. Yesterday, I have uh, mentioned regarding time constant. For adequate exhalation, you give at least three time constant duration for exhalation. Let's see whether our settings are okay with that concept. Here I have set a rate of 15 breaths per minute. That means one breath cycle is four seconds. I ratio one is to three means expiratory time is three seconds. Now we'll see the time constant. We need three times the time constant at least as expiratory time. How do you get the time constant? Resistance into compliance. So 30 into, I mentioned it's in liters. It has to be converted into liter. So it becomes 1.5 seconds time constant. So expiratory time should be three times 1.5. That is at least 4.5 seconds, which is not met with these settings. Do you agree? So what I'll do is probably I'll keep the same tidal volume I'll reduce the uh, ventilatory rate to 12 and increase the IA ratio further to 1 is to 3.5. Again, the further titration will um, depend on the blood gas trend or if you have an ETCO2, ETCO2 trend. Again, one more message is CO2 removal should not be happening in a matter of minutes to hours. It should, you should give enough time for CO2 removal because uh, washing out CO2 from a level of maybe 106 to a perceived normal of 40 in an one hour can have other implications. So the take home message is CO2 removal is inversely proportional to the effective alveolar ventilation. Effective alveolar ventilation means minute ventilation minus dead space ventilation. To avoid dead space ventilation, you should give enough time for exhalation. So the settings would be tidal volume of around six to seven mLs per kg rate of around 12 to 15 low minute ventilation will definitely lead to slight rise in pco2 which is the price we pay for preventing dynamic hyperinflation in fact the current literature suggests the risk of dynamic hyperinflation is much larger than those of permissive hypercapnia so you target a normal ph not a normal co2 there are some factors uh, which uh, mention ventilation difficulties in COPD because the disease may not have a reversible component. It's a progressively deteriorating condition. Quantifying dynamic hyperinflation at bedside is usually difficult. COPD patients are difficult to wean also. There will be other comorbidities and systemic effects. So the decision to intubate if the patient is not a candidate for NIV, non-invasive ventilation, because of a shortage of time, we won't be going into non-invasive ventilation. We have an excellent expert on NAV in our panel, Dr. Anu. Anyway, we'll discuss invasive ventilation only now. Suppose the patient doesn't uh, 
uh, have a successful NIV trial, he will go in for invasive ventilation. So you have to be careful because post intubation AMBU bag ventilation also should have low tidal volume and uh, probably a low rate of around six to seven per minute, which will do a lot of good for your COPD patient. You need to volume resuscitate the patient adequately before uh, attempting induction. And uh, probably you will need a small dose of inotrope or vasopressor in a core pulmonary patient. So if you are uh, choosing volume control mode, control tidal volume will be initial setting will be around six to seven ml per kg. Respirate rate uh, towards the lower range around uh, 12 or so. I ratio with the more of expiratory time. Look at the P plateau and expiratory time constant. Reduce the inspiratory time as much as possible until the plateau pressure reaches 28 centimeters of water in extreme cases. You can use high flows. Maybe normally you will be setting around 40 to 60 liters per minute, but high flows in COPD patients will help you to deliver the volume with the minimum inspiratory time that we are giving to the ventilator. And extrinsic PEEP should be applied to counter the auto PEEP around 50 to 80 percent of the intrinsic PEEP measured. That value is debatable because different authors give uh, different values. And the patient is uh, not passive, patient is taking spontaneous. You can switch over to PSV pressure support ventilation mode. Again, you uh, see for the volume whether it is adequate. Respirate rate and IU ratio cannot be fixed by the operator, but you can again adjust the expiratory trigger sensitivity and rise time that we have already discussed. So management of auto PEEP, low tidal volume, reduce the respiratory rate, increase the expiratory time, increase the peak flow, add extrinsic PEEP, good enough uh, sedation, control of sepsis, bronchodilatation, everything will help tackle the primary condition and minimize auto PEEP. Regarding weaning, weaning begins when the precipitating factor of the respiratory failure is partially or totally reversed. There will be marginal respiratory mechanics because it's a COPD is a tricky situation. Factors which increase the resistance like size of the tube, deposition of secretions in the tube, kinking or curvature of the tube, presence of elbow shaped parts, HME in the circuit, everything should be taken care of. Because these patients are very likely to be on steroids and relaxant for a long time, you need to anticipate for uh, myopathy. Role of tracheostomy in the weaning is uh, debatable. The weaning can be done with pressure support mode or a spontaneous breathing trial while on the mechanical ventilator. In very difficult cases, extubation onto NIV is definitely an option. Core pulmonary may warrant small dose of inotrope, a dose of diuretic and low fluid strategy during the weaning. Okay, so these are the broad principles and I have shown a few ventilator settings to tackle a case of COPD. I think my messages are delivered. If you have more doubts, we'll clarify during Q&A session. Okay, that's it from me for the time being. So I am winding up and uh, I request uh, all the participants to attend the poll questions now. I think if you are uh, viewing on full screen, you can reduce to normal view. And then I think the question is also there in the poll, but I'll read it out for you. The question number one. What action you will take if the patient become agitated during uh, SAT or SBT, spontaneous activating uh, awakening trial or spontaneous breathing trial? Option A, heavily resedate. Option B, resedate to a RAS score of minus 3. Option C, titrate RAS minus 1 and return to previous ventilator settings. Continue with the spontaneous awakening trial or SBT irrespective of the changes. So what action you will take if the patient become agitated during SAT or SBT? Option A, heavily resedate. Option B, resedate to a RAS of minus 3. Option C, titrate RAS minus 1 and return to previous ventilator settings. Option D, continue to uh, spontaneous awakening trials or spontaneous breathing trials. Proceeding to second question, pick out the wrong statement. Okay, question is to pick out the wrong statement regarding COPD ventilator management. Option A, the disease may not have a reversible component. Option B, 
quantifying dynamic hyperinflation at bedside is very difficult option c copd patients are difficult to wean option d the outcome is same as for acute asthma exacerbation management okay i'll move to question number 3 which of the following statement or statements are true regarding the management of auto peep option a low tidal volume decrease the respiratory rate option b increase the expiratory time option c add or addition of extrinsic peep option d all of the above the answers will be discussed in the q and a session following dr anup's lecture um, it's over to dr anup thank you very much thank you dr sanish thanks for this wonderful presentation taking through clinical application and uh, the vent ventilator settings for uh, conditions like copd and other difficult to ventilate cases so you made it so simple and i hope that there is definitely a very useful information shared across so thank you sir and now uh, we invite dr anup kumar to take over the session sir i'm turning it to you all yours sir thank you once again uh... for joining us uh like and again thanks for ji for uh, uh making such a wonderful platform uh module 1 and 2 we had almost uh, 1300 uh, participants so today also we are having an excellent number so thanks for joining us in this uh, third module as well so today uh like uh, the weaning from mechanical ventilation or monitoring case scenarios and copd was discussed by dr sanish so i will be basically discussing ards management the covid management and infection control practices in the covid uh, 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 like in uh, related to the covid 19 so to start with we will uh, go with the definition of uh, ards as you all are aware we have changed the definition now following this berlin definition of ards where the timing should be an acute onset within 7 days after a non clinical insert or a new worsening respiratory symptoms and the edema should should not be fully explained by cardiac failure or fluid overload subjective to assess, uh, subjective assessment by echo so echo should not show the cardiac failure features and based on the oxygenation last time we have discussed based on the pf ratio we can divide it into mild moderate and uh, severe and with the peep of equal to or more than 5 uh, last time someone has asked so peep is this is a peep criteria and the chest imaging uh, should be bilateral opacities with the more than 3 or 4 quadrants not explained by other shadows so this is the definition of uh, ards i am not going into the too much uh, uh, the the theory part of uh, ards and the physiological task in managing any ventilation last time, like last time i already told carbon dioxide elimination oxygenation and assistance of respiratory muscles but in ards our main aim of ventilation is to maintain oxygenation by keeping these closed alveoli open and recruiting more and more uh, closed uh, alveoli so that will be the uh, our aim and this was also discussed last time depending on the severity like from mild to moderate ards for all group we go with a low tidal volume of around 6 ml the peep in the mild we use a very low peep then a moderate peep of around 8 to 10 and severe ards we go with a high peep of 11 to 15 and more than 15 there is no evidence initially with mild ards we can try niv or high flow nasal cannula but with a severe ards we will have to prone ventilate recruitment maneuver sometimes and neuromuscular blockers and severe ards when the pf ratios are less than 50 we go with the uh, ecmo and this was also discussed we have uh, like when we are pushing uh, the air inside there will be a uh, resistance offered then the alveoli will be uh, 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 will be uh, recoiling and the volume will be pushed back and the volume placed in a closed space when you place a volume into the closed space it will increase the pressure and the in ards we will be having a normal alveoli and a alveoli with which are stiff and the normal alveoli will not require 
uh, higher pressure but the stiff alveoli to open up will require more pressure but when you apply the pressure so the pressure uh, will definitely move on to the area of, of less resistance so there can be a chance of uh, uh, over inflation and the volume change for a change in pressure we call it as a compliance so this term and concept should be very very clear to understand uh, covid ventilation also and what pressure we have to monitor we have i already told we have pp uh, we were discussing in copd we plateau we have and we have having driving pressures as well and in mechanical ventilation in ards you should understand there are uh, like in the uh, in the ards length we can have a normal length with uh, uh, like a reduced length volume where we have to use low tidal volume to protect that so we will have to hypoventilate and there will be carbon dioxide uh, retention uh, the next part we have to prevent the cyclical stretching by p for prone by recruiting and the, the the consolidated length we will have to uh, require high high, high uh, pressure to open up either by using recruitment maneuver or by using moderately uh, high peep and uh, with the life threatening refractory hypoxemia we will have to sometimes open up these airways so what is this recruitability we have told last time just uh, uh, refreshing those things so when we put the patient on uh, uh, say uh, uh, volume control mode with 400 ml and 8 peep so this is uh, how it will be it will be just opening up some of the alveoli so now i am increasing the peep so here in uh, the, uh, the when there are responders like where with the higher peep more alveoli will get recruited so these group of persons are called responders and the whole aim of ARDS ventilation is how much peep to uh, peep to be provided to open up these uh, these recruitable lung units but at the same time like if you are applying more pressure there is a chance that these sometimes the small alveoli the normal alveoli can burst and it will not recruit more alveoli and these group of persons are called non responders so we should try to understand in ARDS ventilation who are the responders and what is the optimal peep and what are the other measures uh, by which you can improve the oxygenation uh, status okay so here again you can see if you put a inspiratory hold like in responders you can see here the plateau pressure was 30 driving pressure was 22 so here you can see the plateau pressure was decreasing the driving pressure is decreasing at the same time the compliance is improving so this is how you look like if it is a res responder the driving pressure will drop and the compliance will improve but if it is a non-responder with a peep increment you can see the driving pressure will be shooting up and the compliance will be dropping down okay so this is how you should uh, uh, approach an ARDS patient and again we have to use low tidal volume we have to aim for a low plateau pressure less than 30 uh, 30 high peep to open up uh, the length low driving pressures less than 15 low mechanical power and reduce cumulative injurious strain these last two uh, like because of lack of time we are not making it complicated and when you are applying the pressure obviously the pressure will be utilized to distend the alveoli and again it will be also uh, used uh, to uh, to move the chest wall okay so when the chest wall is stiff obviously you will have to use more pressure to expand the chest and the, the pressure may be exerted to expand the chest and the pressure uh, the alveoli are exposed this what pressure here it is exposed is equivalent to the alveolar pressure minus pressure imposed by the chest wall so this will be the our uh, yeah, like the, the the pleural pressure or otherwise it is called as the trans pulmonary sorry otherwise it is called the, uh, the, the 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 from that pleural pressure we can actually uh, uh, derive what is trans pulmonary pressure so that will be the actual driving force okay so the trans pulmonary pressure is a plateau pressure minus pleural pressure and the length protective strategy in uh, in ARDS will be to keep plateau pressure less than 30 low tidal volume ventilation uh, based on predicted uh, body weight formula which we have discussed last time male it is 30 50 plus uh, 2.3 into 18 inches minus 60 in females it is 45.5 plus 2.3 into 18 inches minus 60 so which uh, uh, with the such low tidal volume deliberate hypoventilation what change will be there there will be carbon dioxide retention uh, then again there can be uh, other issues like uh, 
the inspiratory pressure you can see when uh, you are applying the pressure the driving pressure can change and the plateau pressure can also change the plateau pressure can be determined by an inspiratory hole which we have already discussed last time and the maximum pressure exerted is the peak inspiratory pressure which are, we are we have seen already during copd ventilation and uh, with an inspiratory force we can see the plateau pressure and the, the change between the plateau and the peep is called as a driving pressure so this is a high peep persistence and again we have uh, the driving pressure the plateau pressure the difference of dh we have discussed i'm not wa wa wasting much time here here again you can see the, the 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 compliance or the driving pressure will be equal to the tidal volume divided by the static compliance so here this again the concept should be very clear here in this one patient i am applying a peep of 5 and the total pressure is plateau pressure is 25 so the driving pressure in this patient is 20 so the same patient i am improving i am increasing the peep to 10 so the plateau pressure is now uh, 30 but the driving pressure here is 20 okay so here the more lengths are recruited but the plateau the driving pressure remains same Okay, if sometimes if the recruitment is better, the driving pressure may dip down. So by increasing the PEEP along with the compliance everything, now we give more concentration on driving pressures. So uh, you don't have to worry much about other pressures. Again from 15 we are increasing. Now the plateau pressure is 35, but still the driving pressure is 20. Okay, our target for driving pressure is 15, I have already told, but this is just to make the concept very clear. With increasing PEEP and increasing plateau, you can have a constant driving pressure possible. Okay, so that concept should be clear. And how to uh, uh, see the driving pressure in a in uh, in a pressure control mode? So whatever pressure control over PEEP you are keeping, press plus the PEEP. This is the total pressure control above the PEEP. So the plateau pressure will be the total pressure. So the plateau pressure here it will be 12 plus 18 will be 30. And what will be the driving pressure? The, the pressure above the PEEP. So this will be the driving pressure. So here in a pressure control mode, you know what is the driving pressure and you know what is the uh, what is the uh, 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 what is the plateau, uh, driving pressure and the plateau pressure. So here again you can see the tidal volume divided by the driving pressure. So the compliance, the static compliance will be 25 centimeters of water. This is how we, uh, uh, we come to uh, uh, the calculation or the derivation of static compliance so whereas in volume control mode when we are putting a 450 ml uh, tidal volume with a peep of 12 we will have to put the patient on an inspiratory hole to see what is the plateau pressure here you don't have to do that even without inspiratory uh, hold itself you will uh, get to know what is the uh, the plateau pressure the driving pressure etc this we have discussed last time but uh, just uh, uh, once again refreshing the 15, less than 15 driving pressure by this amateur trial has showed a decrease in mortality. That is why we are trying to keep, ventilate an ARDS patient with a driving pressure of less than 15. The assessment of recruitment can be done in different ways, either by the CT scan, which is a gold standard, impedance tomography, a PV tools, an esophageal uh, uh, balloon looking at pleural pressures, or like a best oxygenation or a best compliance peep. So today's class we will be dis uh, discussing on the best compliance PEEP method and uh, the other option is looking at stress index which we will not be uh, discussing. There are uh, other options like FRC looking at uh, best FRC etc. The simplest way to for PEEP titration is go with an ARSNET uh, PEEP table. There is a high PEEP table and a low PEEP table, table. The majority of the time we use with this low PEEP table which we have discussed. So what is the recruitability now we have already told. So one patient from 8 to 12 when we are applying the PEEP, more alveoli will be recruited in a, recru uh, in a recruited, in a recruitable lung. But if it is a non-recruitable lung, the even the baby lung will rupture. And obviously uh, these patients uh, will be having the worsening compliance. Here you can see the recruiters, the, the, the plateau pressures and compliance will be improving. But here it will be worsening. So here in this group of persons from 8 PEEP when we are increased to 12 PEEP you can see the, the static compliance is uh, reduce, increased from 19 to 25 and the driving pressure has dropped from 22 to 16. So now we want to know whether the, uh, the 12 PEEP is enough or whether we want to give more PEEP. So 
have increased from 12 to 14. So here when I am using a 14 peep, now the plateau pressures are uh, 30, but the driving pressure from 16 to uh, uh, 16 it has gone up to 18 and the compliance is decreasing. So this is how you look at best compliance and best, ox best compliance. So from 18 the compliance is increased to 25 when you are increasing P from 8 to 12. From 12 to 14 when you are increasing you can see uh, the, the, plateau, the, the, the driving pressure and uh, the compliance is decreasing and di driving pressure is going high. That means the optimal P for this patient is 12 centimeters of water. The recruitment to do, uh, the patient should be passive, deeply sedated, the, pa the paralysis is not always ne necessary, patient should be hemodynamically uh, stable and the cuff should be slightly more in inflated. We have discussed this also last time, three types of recruitment, you can give it a sustained uh, uh, inflation or like an incremental peep, gradually you increase the peep to uh, like reaching up to 40, hold it for 40, 30 to 40 seconds, then gradually titrate down. For simple terms, we can con uh, control ventilate with 20 peep and 20 centimeters of pressure above uh, above the peep. So total 40 centimeter for 40 seconds. So this will, method we will be discussing in detail. Okay. So these are the uh, ones uh, like you recruit, you should know what is the optimal peep and how to titrate. So these were the points which we were discussing uh, last time. So now coming to the ARDS uh, ventilator settings once again. So how we will start, any patient when they are hypoxic, you start the ventilation with 100%. But at the same time, you should be aware, you should try to reduce it to the non-toxic level of oxygen, which is 60%. So even when with the 100% or a 90, 80%, your patient is saturating more than 90%, that patient is very, very sick. And somehow with all ventilatory modification, you should try to reduce the FiO2 to 60%. And the tidal volume always you have to try to keep it around uh, 4 to 6 ml and uh, the plateau pressure try to keep it less than 30 and driving pressure less than 25. The PEEP uh, setting I have already told which we will discuss in uh, detail. So PEEP should be set in such a way that it should we should try to reduce the driving pressure to less than 15 for a plateau pressure somewhere around 20 to 28 to 30. And you have to adjust the pH uh, uh, to keep more than 7.25. How we can do that? You increase the respiratory rate. And PCO2, uh, it is always not necessary. You have to keep it less than 50. Uh, you don't have to worry much about the PCO2 values. And the tidal volume depending on different groups, uh, uh, like in majority of the groups, you can keep it somewhere around 4 to 6 ml. And P uh, in mild group, we keep it at our 5 to 8 moderate 8 to 12 and in severe 12 to 16. So now, now we will see these things we have learned last time also. Now see with these things how we are going to ventilate the patient. So I have a patient with severe ARDS. Okay. So now uh, like I have ventilated, I want to recruit this patient. So what I am going to do, see this patient is holding on with a 50% FiO2. So I kept the FiO2 at 50 itself. I kept the pressure control and the control I kept at 20, P at 20 and it is a assist pressure control or PC or an assist pressure control mode and then uh, like I am uh, uh, ventilating it for 40 seconds. So 40 pressure for 40 seconds. Here again you can keep an IE ratio of 1 is to 1. This is for 30 to 40 seconds. So after that what we do? This is the problem. So now we have already recruited. The saturation is improving. So what to do now? So now you know the like uh, the compliance here is 20, like tidal volume by driving pressure. So here again the the uh, the the plateau pressure, as you know, the plateau pressure is 40, and the driving pressure, the difference is 20. So now we know that driving pressure is high, the plateau pressure is also high. We are trying to open up maximum alveoli. Now what we can do? So now the the driving pressure we want is 15. So what you have to do, the pressure control you reduce to 15. So now your driving pressure will be 15. The PEEP you want to see what is the optimal PEEP. So once the lungs are completely open up, you can try something like a uh, down, downward titration of PEEP. So now from 20, I have reduced my PEEP to 16. So what should I know whether the 20 PEEP is better or 16 PEEP is better? How will I know? 
I just put an inspiratory hold. I, I just measured the ply tube. Now see the ply tube pressures are coming down and see the compliance. From the 20, the compliance has improved to 24. Okay. At the same time, you have to see whether you are getting an adequate tidal volume also because it, this is in the pressure control. Okay. Now I have reduced the PEEP to 16. Now I am getting a compliance of 24. Still I don't know whether this is the optimal uh, setting because the compliance is 24. Uh, sometimes this PEEP may not be required. So I will again reduce the PEEP to 2 again. So now in the pr same pressure control, same FIO2, I have reduced from 16 to 14. So now again with the inspiratory hole, you see what is happening to the compliance. Now the compliance is again slightly improving. So how will you know? The driving pressure is constant here because you are ventilating with a pressure control. So whatever pressure control you are keeping above PEEP will be the driving pressure. So you have complete control of driving pressure here. So the driving pressure here again 15 but the compliance is improving here and the plateau pressures are also improving here. Obviously that will be re re reflected by improving tidal volume. Last time someone was asking how much time you have to uh, wait between uh, like the changes. Again there is nothing like a fixed time. You can uh, give it uh, somewhere around 5 to 10 minutes and wait what changes is happening. So now I don't know whether the 14 is adequate so I am changing to 12. So when I am changing the P from 14 to 12, again you can see my plateau pressure is dipping, the compliance is improving and obviously the tidal volume also has to improve. Okay. So now with the reduction in PEEP also I am having an improvement in compliance. So the patient does not require 20, 16 or 14 PEEP. With the 12 PEEP the patient is having better compliance than the previous higher values. So I have to again down titrate and see. Now again with the same setting I have reduced the PEEP to 10. I have measured the compliance. So here you see now the compliance is dipping. That means what does it indicate? So the patient best PEEP here is based on the compliance it is 12. I have already told there are many methods for PEEP titration. This is a one simple bedside method by which you can titrate PEEP for ARDS. Okay. This is the, like uh, I have already told this is a uh, uh, three sessions only. We have so many topics to cover. So at least this basic concept if you understand you can ventilate a a severe ARDS patient. So I think that concept is very very clear. This is called the decremental titration of PEEP. So you recruit with a high PEEP, gradually reduce the PEEP values and see at what PEEP the patient is having a best compliance. Now you are in a pressure controlled decremental PEEP titration. Now we again uh, go with uh, 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 like you can see I have again recruited the patient uh, FIO250 pressure controlled PEEP 20. Now I am uh, 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 seeing the patient with a volume control mode. How to titrate the PEEP in a volume control mode? So majority of the trials are done in a volume control mode. So here I have calculated and uh, with the predicted body weight I have calculated around the 6 ml and it is coming 350 ml. So from uh, 16 I have reduced the PEEP to sorry 20 I have reduced the PEEP to 16. I have uh, put it in an inspiratory hold and now my driving pressure is almost same. The compliance is 24, the plateau is 36. So here two things you cannot accept now. The driving pressure is high more than 15, the plateau pressure is also more than 30. So you, do, you cannot accept this much secretion, uh, this much settings. So now again you try to reduce these values by reducing the PEEP. So from 16 you are again reduce the PEEP to 15. 14 you keep the tidal volume constant and see what is happening to the uh, the driving pressure. So at 14 you can see the driving pressure is again dropping to 18. The compliance is actually slightly improving. The plateau pressure is dipping. Now you are at a 14 PEEP. The same thing we are repeating. We are This is in the volume control mode. Last time what we did the same thing. Now again I am dropping the PEEP to 12. I am putting at inspiratory hold. See the plateau pressure. Now it is again dipping. Driving pressure is reaching at the target. Now it is at 15 the compliance is improving. So now this driving pressure is at an acceptable level. Plateau is also at an acceptable level. Compliance is also improving. But we, we will see if I uh, drop the PEEP again whether the compliance is going to improve. I am again dropping the uh, PEEP to 10. Keep, uh, like keeping the, this is, sorry, this is volume control 350 ml. 
sorry for this mistake, volume control 350 ml. So here you can see in the inspiratory hole I am getting a plateau of almost uh, same, but again you can see uh, the, the compliance is decreasing and the driving pressure is increasing. That means here this is the ideal P for the patient. So now again a volume control mode with a decremental P, a, 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 a tidal volume of 6 ml per kg. This is how you titrate for the PEEP. Now you see the next patient like uh, I am having a patient, I am uh, like an ARDS patient, I am just ventilating the patient, patient is extremely hypoxic. I have, that is why after intubation I put the patient on FiO2 100 percentage, tidal volume of 400, slightly high PEEP 7. Then I measured the inspiratory hold. So I am getting uh, like a plateau pressure of 36, driving pressure is very high, compliance is 25. And I, IA ratio I kept it 1.2 and respiratory rate is 18. So I have already told if you are going for an ABG, you have to always mention what is the FiO2, what is the PEEP, what is the ventilatory uh, 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 tidal volume and respiratory rate. So or you can write the minute ventilation, here the minute ventilation will be 400 into 18, that will be the minute ventilation tidal volume times respiratory rate. This will have to take it as 0.4 into 8, 18. Okay. So I did a monitoring. So the monitoring now showing a SpO2 of 92 percentage and my ABG is showing 7.3 pH, PO2 of 80, PCO2 of 38. Are you happy with this thing? Are you happy? You are happy having a saturation of 92. Last time itself we have discussed, we have to look at PF ratio. So the PF ratio here is you are having a 100 percent saturation and P, so the PaO2 is 80. So 80 by 1. So you are having a PF ratio of 80 where you are in a severe ARDS group and now you are in a high FiO2 of in a toxic limit. So somehow you have to reduce the FiO2. So what we can do to reduce the FiO2? Again we will have to open up more airways. So what can I do? Like I have again see now the plateau pressure I, my aim is to reduce the driving pressure and reduce the plateau pressure. So obviously I will have to reduce the tidal volume, I reduce the tidal volume. And as the saturation is slightly high, I am re slightly reducing the FiO2. P from 7 I am increasing to 10. Now with the inspiratory hold, my plateau pressures are dipping, driving pressures are dipping, compliance is not having a much change. And to improve the oxygenation in an ARDS, you have to give always more inspiratory type. So from 1 is to 2, I made it to 1 is to 1.5. And as I am reducing the respiratory rate to keep the minute ventilation and to keep the CO2, uh, 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 to, uh, to uh, keep the CO2 within the almost normal limit, I have to increase the respiratory rate also. So I have increased the respiratory rate. Okay. Now see my SpO2 is slightly better as I am increasing the PEEP. At 80%, I am getting 94%. The pH, even though the PCO2 is 54, but my pH is uh, maintained. I am not worried about that. And the PF ratio also, like you can see, uh, the PaO2 by FiO2 will be somewhere around 82 by 0.8 will be more than 100. It is improving. So now again, I will see, like I have to see, I still am at 80 percentage. So I have to still improve the oxygenation. So now I have increased the PEEP to 12. And obviously, as the saturation was improving, I have reduced FiO2 to the target level of 60 percentage. Now with an inspiratory hold, I have measured the plateau pressure. It is 15. The driving pressure is 50, uh, 15 and the compliance is also improving. Now I am in a target driving pressure. What other change I can make? Uh, like I can make an IE ratio of 1 is to uh, 1 and I can slightly increase the respiratory rate if required if the pH is dropping. Here actually the pH was uh, not dropping. So the pH is, this, with this pH I don't have to change, but there was another ABG, so where I was uh, like, uh, uh, that I, it was showing a dip in uh, the, uh, the pH, that is why I've increased the rate. So with 30 rate, now I'm able to maintain a pH of 7.2, but you can see the PCO2 is still at 62. So friends, please keep in mind, you don't have to look at PCO2 and increase the respiratory rate or tidal volume. You can accept this CO2, that is the permissive hypercapnia which we have already discussed. You just look at the, P, uh, the, the pH and try to keep it more than 7.15 to 7.2. And now you have increased the PEEP to 12. Still, you, and again, IE ratio you have to keep and in a severe hypoxemia, 
one is to one respiratory rate you can go up to 35 to maintain the pH. So now again I am increasing the PEEP. I don't know whether this PEEP is enough. So this is called the incremental titration. Last time we were doing the decremental. So now I, after ventilating I am slightly increasing. So from 12 I have increased the PEEP to 14. So the plateau pressures are going high. The driving pressures are also going high. The compliance is not, uh, the compliance is also dipping. So this means the, the, the patient does not require 14 PEEP. The 12 PEEP is having a better recruitment. Okay. This is how you do an incremental titration of PEEP. This is like after an intubation of an ARDS patient, how I have changed the PEEP and how I have monitored the driving pressure and compliance, what other changes in IE ratio I made, how I changed the respiratory rate for a uh, target pH. So this is how we change the uh, uh, we change the settings. Here we don't have to worry because as uh, the compliance start dipping, you don't have to further increase and see it is like it, this is again uh, the compliance is again dipping. You don't have to worry. But here you can see if you are again increasing, that will further reduce the uh, uh, the plateau, uh, the further reduce the compliance. Okay. So once you see that the compliance is dipping, you have to stop at that point and come back to the previous value. Don't have to again uh, recruit more and see whether it is improving. This is how you do the incremental PEEP titration. Now, I think you understood what is the ARDS ventilation concept. So now with this uh, the knowledge of ARDS ventilation, now we move on to the COVID ventilation. So before starting COVID ventilation, we all should have a basic concept about COVID-19 and how to use the drugs. So I've seen many clinicians doing mistake. That is why I am uh, selecting, I am starting with this slide. So you can see initially uh, like up to uh, almost uh, 10 days there is a peaking of viremia and that gradually by about 10th day the viremia settles down. It will again uh, by 10th day the patient won't be viremic, patient won't be able to transmit the disease and that viremia will settle down. And even if you do a PCR at this, po is po this point of time, PCR may show positivity that means that is only the some fragmented uh, the viral particles the patient will not be infected. Regarding the oxygen saturation, the patient will be a normal oxygen saturation up to about even 10 days. Later on the patient can develop inflammation which is called as an early pulmonary phase and can develop hypoxemia. So this is also very very important the, like especially the patients with comorbidities and patients with the high CRP, D-dimer values, etc. These patients, even though their oxygen saturation remains same up to 7-8 days, they can further deteriorate afterwards. So, a patient remaining uh, normal, no, remaining in normal oxygenation does not mean that that patient will be in the stable stage. They can go into early pulmonary phase and develop complication. That is why you have to watch the, such patients for at least 14 days. Then coming to the inflammatory response. Initial 5 to 7 days you won't get an inflammatory response. But later on after the end of one week you, the patient will develop inflammatory response. By the time the viremia will settle down. So here at this point you have to start the inflammatory therapy. Now coming to the treatment part. So in the viremic phase when the viral load is high, so this is the phase where you will have to start antivirals and with the available evidences, the remdesivir is the antiviral drug with, uh, with a reasonably good evidence. So if the patient is having a persistent fever or likely to deteriorate because of these symptoms etc, you start the patient on remdesivir at this point. Suppose your patient is becoming hypoxemic by about 10th day. Okay, the patient is desaturating. See, by this time your viremia has completely failed. It, you have already closed after 10 days. So there is no point in giving an antiviral drug after 10 days. This concept should be very, very clear. I've seen many clinicians doing the mistake starting an antiviral drug after 10 days. So that is because that clinician is not having the basic concept of the disease. Now coming to the inflammatory phase. So there is an early inflammatory phase where the patient will be having a dip in saturation and the, the mild oxygen requirement will go into a high oxygen requirement. Patient will become tachypneic and you will have to start the patient either on 
hypo nasal cannula for NIV. So that those are the group of patients who are going to benefit with uh, dexamethasone based on the recovery trial. So even if the patient is having a mild hypoxemia requiring oxygen, you don't require a dexamethasone for that patient. We don't have enough evidence for the such group. A patient who is requiring NIV, HFNC or high flow oxygen, definitely you have to start the patient on steroid. The same way those patients who are ventilated also, they will benefit from steroid. If this patient is again going for the severe inflammatory response where your ferritin values are going high, LDH is going high, patient is having persistent temperature, interleukin levels are high, you do something like an H score and see the H score is more than 150 or 169. So these are the group of patients where uh, you will have to start the other uh, like immunomodulatory uh, drugs like tocilizumab. So I think now this concept is very, very clear. Okay. So this is how we uh, treat the patient with COVID-19. Now coming to the oxygenation part. So if the patient is having a, a, a PF ratio of less than 150 and hypoxemic, there is no doubt you have to uh, mechanically ventilate the patient and go with the lung protective strategies. If that oxygenation is mildly, uh, 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 sorry, in the PF ratio more than 150, you start the patient on NIV or an HFNC then you can monitor these persons and see whether these persons are deteriorating and if showing that they, if they are showing a deteriorating trend immediately you have to intubate the patient so here how will we uh, optimize the patient on uh, niv so niv as you know we have an ipap and an epap so here in this patient you can see a huge tidal volume so there will be a overstretching of lens because of this uh, like a, a, a significant respiratory effort so this patient if you connect into the resp uh, in the into the niv you can see they are they will be generating huge tidal volume more than 700 or 800 so this will cause an overstretching of lung fields and that will produce something called a pcl or a patient induced self inflicted lung injury okay so you have to prevent that overstretching what we can do you increase the epap so once you increase the BEPAP, your tidal volume will reduce and again the IPAP you have to keep it in the minimum level. You don't have to give more IPAP when the patient is having a significant respiratory drive. This is how you start the patient on a uh, NIV. Now suppose if the patient is uh, uh, requiring a high oxygen re requirement, not comfortable with uh, uh, normal oxygen, then you can start other option is high flow nasal cannula where you can give a high FiO2 up to 100% uh, uh, of a humidified oxygen. Here you will be setting uh, like a, uh, the temperature, the FiO2, FiO2 you can set by adjusting the flow of uh, oxygen and again the flow in the machine. So the flow in the machine, especially when you need a PEEP effect, you have to keep somewhere uh, more than 40, so 40 to 60 liters flow you have to keep. FiO2 you titrate based on the respiratory the the oxygenation requirement so now you have started patient either on hfno or niv so now you should understand whether these patients are responding to uh, niv or hfnc from this point onwards you should be very very clear and i think this is the area where majority of us are doing mistake so what we will do we will keep the patient on niv or hfnc we will gradually increase the uh, fio2 to 80 90 100 etc or like in NIV, we keep the oxygen, the maximum flow possible. The patient may be breathing at 30, 35, 40 respiratory rate. The saturation will be 90, 91. You are happy because the patient is saturation is 90. But you are not looking at how much oxygen you are giving. And once you keep this patient on such a fluctuating tidal volume and high respiratory rate, they are going to develop severe self-inflicted lung injury. And once that damage has occurred, definitely you won't be able to rescue that patient. So, dear friends, please understand that the patient on NIV or HFNC, you should understand at what point you have to stop these and you have to ventilate that patient. If you are delaying ventilation in that group of patients, you may not be able to rescue those patients. Even the patients who are dying in my unit, like those who are referred from outside, majority of the time this is the issue. When we get a phone call, they say that the patient is stable on NIV, saturating at 92 percentage. Yesterday also I had a phone call. 
So I told I want to know the details. So the, those people don't even know how much FIO2 they are keeping. So when I asked the FIO2 was almost 90 percentage, he is saturating at 92. Then I asked for an ABG. ABG was showing his uh, uh, CO2 values of, values of 18 and the pH of 7.6. What does it mean? The patient has already gone for an alkalosis, respiratory alkalosis. Why? He is severely tachypneic. You can see from that ABG itself. So such group of patients, then I asked, so they told like five days like he is on, he's like that. Then when we shift that patient, we can see extensive lung damage. Whatever treatment you give to such patients, it is very, very difficult to rescue those patients. So please don't unnecessarily prolong intubation and keep your patients on NIV. So now coming to the, uh, the NIV tolerability, how will you see? The patients on NIV, HFNC or high oxygen, how to assess that patient? So this is based on this uh, ROCA's paper. We call it as a ROCA index. So the ROCA index is, Ro sorry, ROX index. It is called uh, the, uh, by the ROCA. So this is the, uh, the ratio of SpO2 you divided by the FiO2 to the respiratory rate. So if it is less than 5, that means the patient is deteriorating. You have to uh, assess this index every 2 hourly and see whether this patient is tolerating or not. If ROX index is uh, more than 5, you can comfortably keep this patient on NIV or HFNC or oxygen. If it is ROX index is less than 5, immediately you have to think about in each, uh, in ventilating such patients. Now, I have already told this patient, uh, I have put on HFNC. Now, the patient is on FIO2 of 50. SpO2 is 90, 94%. Respiratory rate is 20. So, how will you calculate ROX index? So, ROX index is SpO2 divided by FIO2. So, 94 divided by 50 FIO2 means 0.5 divided by respiratory rate 20, so 9.4. So now the ROX index is 9.4 and you see subsequently what is the ROX index. So if the ROX index is slightly going up, that means the patient is improving. The same patient I can see another patient I am putting on nasal oxygen. The patient is on 3 liters per minute of, sorry this is minute. So patient is on 3 liters per minute of oxygen. So how will I calculate the FiO2? FiO2 will be 21 plus 3 into 4 because every 1 liter you have to add 4 percentage from the base uh, baseline uh, room air FiO2 of 21. So for 3 liters, 3 into 4. So total will be 33 percentage. Patient is saturating at 94. The respiratory rate is now 30. So now you have to see what is the SpO2 94 divided by 0.33 and again. Uh, divided by the respiratory rate 30. So it is ROX index is 9.5. You see this both patients are equally sick, sick now. The patient on 3 liters per minute but his respiratory rate is very high and his saturation is low. So that is why his ROX index is 9.5. This patient on FiO2 50 is also maintaining a ROX index of 9.4. So this, the severity wise both are almost equal. Okay. Now another method of the uh, like assessing the tolerability of HFNC and NIV is looking at work of breathing index. Here you can see respiratory rate by counting. You can see less than 21, 21 to 25, 2, 26 to 33 and more than 34. If there is a nasal flaring during inspiration as is shown in this picture, it, it is called, it is given one point. If the neck muscles, sternocleidomastoids are in use during inspiration by palpation, you can give one point. And abdominal muscles are in use during expiration, you can see by palpation, it can be given one point. So if this work of uh, breathing index is more than four, that also indicates that the patient is not tolerating your therapy. Or in simple words, if the patient is extremely tachypneic on oxygen or NIV or HFNC, either you have to modify the settings of uh, these uh, 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 devices. If you put an HFNC, you will have to increase the flow from 40 to 60. If it is on an NIV, you have to try increasing the EPAP and see whether the patient is tolerating. Here at least two hours you have to wait and see whether the, what is the difference. Like two hour, four hour, six hours like that, you have to see the ROX index or work of breathing index. Okay. If it is tolerating, you can continue. Otherwise, you will have to think about intubating the patient. So now see this diagram, this is this is the basically you can see the first diagram is with the spontaneous breathing, the lung, uh, lung expansion and this is with the controlled breathing, different phases of respiration. You see with the spontaneous breathing how much overstretching is happening to the lungs. So once this overstretching and silly has damaged the lung parenchyma, 
it will be very very difficult to rescue such patients so even when you control ventilate you can see this is the patient with the mechanical ventilation and spontaneous ventilation see these red red areas are indicating the volumetric strain so on spontaneous breathing patients you can see how much strain it is happening but in controlled ventilation the strain will be less so you need timely intubation so that is the first concept you should be very very clear as far as a covid ventilation is concerned covid ventilation is concerned don't think that if you delay the intubation the patient is going to survive no patient will not survive so that point should be clear and there are many data also like uh, the relative risk of death in the hospital increases as you are delaying the uh, the intubation in a nasal uh, na uh, high flow nasal cannula so the high flow nasal cannula fail you can see the time as you increase the the risk of hospital death is also more now you have decided your rox index is down your patient is in a isolation room if possible in a negative pressure room you have decided to ventilate this patient so how you are going to ventilate you put the patient in a negative pressure isolation room if possible keep the ventilator uh, sorry monitor on one side your airway uh, equipment uh, like your tubes uh, the buji all things you keep in other side the the person who is going to intubate should be here you can keep the ventilator also here then the drugs monitor etc other monitors you keep it here and the person these are the sorry these are the this is the person who is going to monitor the ventilator and the monitor and he is the person who is going to give you the drug and this is the person who is going to give you the equipment airway equipment and required pressure if required so in an intubating room you need only three persons and everything should be ready and if the patient is uh, like you can either uh, put the patient initially on nid on ventilator itself and pre oxygenate with the ventilator or if the patient is on a high flow nasal cannula you can use that itself and then uh, with that pre oxygenation you can go for a intubation the skilled uh, intubator or experienced intubator should always do that if possible uh, do a uh, video uh, laryngoscope and again if that uh, uh, the uh, the you can if the intubating uh, the hood if you want you can use that also outside the room you need a runner this is the person who is going to get you the equipments or like any drugs if it is required so this is how you have to place the patient you have to place the uh, three persons inside how to assist that now see how you are going to modify your ambu bag so i have already told uh, like you have to do the modification in niv circuit hfnc and uh, in ventilators and ambu bag uh, to reduce the uh, the aerosol generation here what you have to can understand is you are uh, like uh, when you are ventilating the patient the, 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 there is an expiratory part here where you are keeping a peep valve also so before this expiratory part or between the patient and and the expiratory part you have to keep a viral filter so whatever uh, uh, the expiratory air is coming that will be coming after filtering into the viral filter this is how you have to keep an ambu bag now one more thing you should be very very clear before going into the covid ventilation what is compliance a patient with a high compliance means this is a very thin a flyable lung which is easily distensible okay very easy to uh, uh, the distance so this group of patients with high compliance will be having a low elastic recoil or this is called as a low elastance group okay high compliance will be having a low elastance or the compliance and elastance are inversely proportional so this is a stiff lung where the patient will be having a low uh, compliance but high elastic recoil so this group will be having a high elastance okay so this is a patient with a normal compliance and a reduced compliance and the compliance is basically a distensible lung will be very compliant and a stiff lung will be less compliant okay i think that concept about ards is very clear now we will move on to the air uh, the covid ards so we have two variants described by gattinoni but one is called the type 1 variant otherwise it is called an l type and a type 2 variant otherwise called as an h variant here you can see the lung fields will be almost normal there will be slightly patchy consolidations here at this point you can see there is a, like a significant consolidation looking like our normal ards one more point i wanted to add at this point 
So this week I have uh, I got at least uh, uh, six references like a patient, a young patients who are completely normal. The clinician wanted to assess his lungs and they are taking uh, a, a CT for that lung. An asymptomatic patients a CT. So majority of the COVID patients, even if they are uh, uh, com completely normal, if you do a CT, you can see some of these peripheral shadows. That doesn't mean that the patient is sick or the patient is going to uh, develop a severe lung changes and you have to bombard him with all antiviral steroids everything. I have already told the steroid evidence is for a significant hypoxemic patients on mechanical ventilation, NIV or HFNC, not for uh, uh, non-hypoxemic patients. And hypoxia means your saturation should be less than 94% at least or 92%. Okay? If, if the saturation is somewhere around 95, 96, don't assume it is low and start steroid. Please don't do that. Steroids are having so many other issues also. So don't think that all COVID patients should receive steroid. So this is the uh, the, the type 1 lung. So here, what is the, the, the difference? The, these patients with a normal lung fields will be having a high compliance. But as we have told, they will be having a low elastance. So this low elastance, this is called as L group. So they also will require, uh, they also will be having low ventilation perfusion ratio, uh, low lung weight and low recruitability. These group of patients are not recruitable. Now we have other group of patients. These are just like any other ARDS. They will be having uh, a low compliance but high elastance, high uh, left to right shunt, uh, again high right to left shunt and again high lung weight and high recruitability. So this group of patients will require high PEEP and this group of patients will not require high PEEP and you can manage the hypoxemia with high FiO2. How we are going to do that? I have already told this is the one uh, patient we have uh, like uh, basically uh, this is a, like, a, uh, like a normal patient developing uh, like a ARDS. So usually there can be a hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction that will not happen and there will be micro thrombate to the vasculature and there can be high shunt and they will be developing hypoxemia. Okay. So these are the patients who are not responding to P for recruitment with normal compliance. So your, their alveoli is absolutely normal as you can see. The problem is with their vasculature. But there are other group of patients where they are having the flooding of uh, their alveoli like any other ARDS. So they are the group with low compliance, high elastance, so called H group who are going to respond to high P, prone position, etc. Okay, and a high respiratory rate can be because of hypoxemia, an increased metabolic demand and cytokine stroke and neurotropism. Why that is important? Whenever you are assessing ROX index also, you see whether the respiratory rate is more uh, because of uh, like a fever or a cytokine storm or a secondary infection, etc. Those parameters you can uh, definitely control and you can give some more time for those patients for initiating intubation. So now the evolution of the disease. I have already told we will be having a type uh, L patient with a high compliance. So they may sometimes remain unchanged for a period. Then they can gradually uh, improve or sometimes they can uh, uh, go worsen also. This L group of patients can develop multiple lung shadows and can uh, deteriorate. This is basically because of patient self-inflicted lung injury. So this L group of patients also when you are ventilating, you should try to avoid this patient self-inflicted lung injury. So that can again produce lung edema, dependent atelectasis, uh, the increasing lung weight, injury attributable to high stress ventilation, evolution of more evolution of COVID-19 pneumonia and NH pneumonia. Okay. So the, 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 the change from L to H is possible, the severity can change. Now, this is a very, very important slide. So, people are getting confused between H and L type and how to keep an FIO2 and P. Which group you have to keep, give more P and which group you have to keep in a normal P. Suppose you forget about CT finding everything. I have an IRDS patient. I have started on, uh, uh, sorry, I have a COVID patient developing hypoxemia. I started the patient on HFNC, put on optimal settings. Now the ROX values are coming down to 
uh, almost a four or four point five, less than five. I've even tried uh, NIV keeping high EPAP or optimal settings. Still, the ROX values are less than five. I've decided to intubate the patient. I've intubated the patient. I put the patient on volume control mode. I put the patient on 100% FIO2. Tidal volume I kept it 400. PPET 7. So what I have to do next? I have see. I have to see what is the driving pressure and what is the compliance. I have put the patient on inspiratory hold. So my plateau pressures are high. Now the compliance is very low, and the driving pressure is high. Okay, look at here. The driving pressure is high. The compliance is low. The plateau pressure is very high for a normal tidal volume. So what does it mean? Mean. So this is a patient who is going to respond for a incremental PEEP because here the driving pressure is high, the compliance is low, so this is a recruitable leg. So you forget about HL everything. So only thing if the plateau pressures are high, you have to look for the compliance and if the, and the compliance is low, you have to titrate the PEEP. And this is the so called which group of patient it will be? Low compliance means it is high elastin. So this is a H group. Okay. So forget about H group all those things. So here you have to definitely increase the PEEP. Now coming to the, uh, the I've uh, kept other settings at I ratio 1 is to 2, respiratory rate 18, etc. Okay. So this is the now almost the patient will be having a severe ARDS like picture, your uh, low compliance uh, or high elastin H group. Now I am when uh, this is a type H with low compliance. Now, this, I have another patient, the same, not tolerating HFA, HFNC, NIV, I have ventilated, same settings, I put at FIO200, tidal volume 14, and PEEP at 7. So, here I am doing an inspiratory hold, I am seeing a very low plateau pressure, 24, driving pressure is extremely low, and the compliance is very good. So, this is a very good compliant length with a very low driving pressure. So, this group of patients are not going to improve with a higher PEEP. So, here this group of patients when you are ventilating, you can accept them like a reasonably good tidal volume and again you can accept high FIO2 levels. Don't try to uh, like target a FIO2 of 60 in this patient. You can keep a titrating an FIO2 for a saturation of somewhere around 90-92 but not more than 92. So, try to keep it a minimum FIO2 but don't try to recruit this patient. So, this patient what will I do? Like this is the patient with type uh, L and high uh, high compliance. Okay, so here there is no role for increasing PEEP. You keep it at whatever PEEP, five to seven, uh, like a, a six to seven ml tidal volume. Here again, you have to see whether the patient is not hyperventilating. If the patient is having hyperventilation and high tidal volume, obviously you have to keep more PEEP as I've already shown in uh, non-invasive uh, sorry NIV diagram. Other option everybody is thinking like if you want to reduce the respiratory drive and to control ventilate you have to always paralyze and ventilate. Not true always. You don't have to paralyze always. Instead you can use high dose of opioid and benzodiazepine in such group of patients. Suppose this group, this patient what I am going to do. So here as I want to do I have already told I can keep the patient at PEEP 7. I can uh, look at uh, FIO2 if 90 is required I keep at FIO2 of 19. I may not require this much high respiratory rate, I can still re reduce the respiratory rate. But this group of patients, what I will do, I from 7, I try to increase the PEEP to 10, I reduce the tidal volume to 350 to reduce the plateau pressure. Here now you can see the plateau pressure is reducing, but driving pressure is still high, the compliance is not changing. So I have again increased the PEEP to 12. Uh, now the plateau pressure is less than 50, uh, 27, driving pressure is almost reaching to, uh, 15. And I am keeping an IE ratio of 1 is to 1 to improve the oxygenation. I am increasing the respiratory rate also. So this is a group of patient who you have to manage like any other ARDS patient. But when the plateau pressures and the driving pressures are low, this is the group of patients who is having issues with the perfusion. Their length, parenchyma and compliance is almost normal. You should not use very high PEEP in this patient that will damage their lung again. Okay, so these are the, these are the basic concept of uh, COVID ventilation. You forget about HL and all, just ventilate normally, see what is the driving pressure, plateau pressure. If the plateau pressure are high, obviously they will be PEEP responders. You have to use PEEP. If your plateau pressures are normal with the normal driving pressure, 
you cannot recruit those patients don't go for a high peep use a 5 to 7 peep and you, you high fio2 is acceptable in this group of patients but again if, even if you start with a this group of patients gradually they can also worsen into uh, like a low compliant lead here like when you are optimizing which we have already discussed how to optimize the peep how to optimize ie ratio everything we have discussed you go with that okay just like in normal ards here, here again don't think about uh, ventilator induced lung injury other stress factors and respiratory rate look at ph and decide the uh, respiratory rate forget about pco2 you can accept i pco2 values now this is again another excellent review in the current opinion critical care so uh, uh, this is like they were looking at spontaneous effort at lower peep and higher peep here you can see the 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 the, the, the plural pressure swing is minus 20 at uh, uh, at a lesser peep but with a higher peep that plural swing can be reduced so the inflammation also will be less so when you are weaning and when you when you see that the, the the plural pressure swing or the tidal volume variation is too high you can put that patients on higher peep and you can reduce this uh, fluctuation same is applicable in niv also you can use the patient on high epap okay so the peep can also reduce spontaneous effort and can reduce a self inflicted lung injury you don't have to paralyze your patient always what are the other changes you are going to make in a ventilator uh, like like heated humidifier try to avoid that even if you are uh, using a heated humidifier uh, like you have to use a heated circuit with uh, the, uh, the heated wires in the circuit uh, other than that the normal humidifier should not be used you have to always use a closed suction otherwise the chances of aerosol generation will be high you should never use a nebulization in a COVID patient or a COVID suspected patient nowadays in our ICU, they stop nebulization for all patients because you, as you know, even after a PCR is negative, at any time they can become positive or you may be missing one case. So you have to always use a MDI adapter and using an MDI adapter, uh, like uh, you can use these uh, uh, meter dose inhalers instead of uh, nebulization and uh, like you can the spacers we cannot use with the ventilator circuit but there are different devices this is called as other devices which can be connected to the uh, ventilator circuit mdi adapters different types of mdi adapters are there so you uh, start using an mdi adapter to your ventilatory circuit and you have to always place a, uh, a viral filter also where all, all you will place a viral filter one thing at the uh, like at the Y port you can keep a uh, 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 viral filter and again at the expiratory port also. So two viral filters should be placed for all patients or an HME filter is also good enough at patient end or uh, and one at expiratory port. Okay, so no closed section. Sorry, no open section. No uh, normal uh, humidifiers. No nebulizers for COVID patients. Now coming towards the end of our uh, session what are the infection control practices we usually adopt so uh, here uh, the infection control practices for ventilators are you have to always use a single uh, patient use circuit reusable circuits are not at all advisable for covid patients i know nowadays we are not using that and again we don't have to unnecessarily chain the circuit only if it is severely uh, soiled you have to chain that otherwise keep the same circuit as we are doing for other patients you don't have to routinely uh, routinely uh, remove, uh, chain the circuit and ventilator circuits are usually having high concentration of uh, pathogens so which may induce VAP therefore this condensate this, this secretion should be removed regularly so whenever you are disconnecting the circuit this is another point you should be uh, very very clear a COVID patient whenever you are uh, disconnecting either to chain the filter or to put a closed section or to remove the closed section or to put a like aspiratory filter you have to always put the ventilator on standby then you just keep uh, a little bit uh, distance away from the patient then you connect all these uh, gadgets okay otherwise don't uh, uh, open the circuit when the ventilator is on because there will be huge aerosol generation you are likely to get infected the closed section is always preferred i've already told 
the place filter in both inspiratory and expiratory end of the ventilator replace uh, the filters if the resistance is increasing this is a very very uh, common mistake nowadays what we are observing in the icus like you will be putting the patient on a viral filter somebody will be giving nebulization obviously when you nebulize using the filters this filters will get uh, 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 more clogged and the resistance will increase obviously the ventilator won't be able to push the air through that filter your airway pressures will go high so any patient if you see the airway pressure is going high that means you are you have to change the respiratory the filter the same way one filter at the maximum you can keep it for one day not more than that you will have to change the filter every day so you and or like if the respiratory uh, the resistance is increasing the pressures are going high definitely you will have to change the filters now what are the after ventilating a covid patient how you are going to disinfect your ventilator again a very commonly asked question so first thing what you have to do is you have to do the surface disinfection just like the previously what we are using like insudor whatever solution you are using or you can hypochlorite you can use or like a hyper high uh, uh, like 70 percent more uh, spirit you can use whatever solution your hospital infection control policy is there to cleaning the equipments or surface cleaning the same thing can be used for cleaning the ventilator surfaces okay you have to uh, uh, the breathing circuit etc you have to dispose uh, it as a medical waste the the patient usually the ventilator will be having an inspiratory and expiratory valve so if the patient is usually will be having an inspiratory valve the components of uh, the ventilator that need to be cleaned or disinfected are mainly the flow sensors located in the exhalation valve and the expiratory side of the ventilator so from the inspiratory side you are pushing the air out so there is no chance of the machine getting infected the expiratory part also you have already put the filter at two points so it's unlikely that the machine will get uh, soiled or the the, the 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 contaminated still if the patient the ventilator is having an expiratory side wall you can uh, remove that and clean it okay if it is a removable wall the cleaning you can do it with a eto sterilization or your hospital protocol so thank you so much uh, again i really enjoyed these uh, three sessions we tried to cover uh, the basic concepts of mechanical ventilation given more importance to ards copd ventilation and the major concepts about uh, covid ventilation the covid management was also covered and thank you so much for the persons who have joined from bangladesh uh, nepal sri lanka and other countries and uh, we will again continue to meet with the regular programs those who are uh, like interested in acute care medicine ventilation and other critical care topics please follow our uh, online uh, 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 the learning platform which is called as classes in acute care medicine with the precision understanding and simplicity we call it as webinar campus so we have a, uh, a youtube channel we have an fb page so please uh, uh, like uh, those two you can subscribe our youtube channel you can again like our fb page and we have a uh, like uh, uh, telegram channel as well so you can uh, join our telegram and this is my email id and personal whatsapp this is an indian number double nine six one zero eight triple five eight those who want to join for our further uh, like uh, educational series on covid acute care management etc uh, you can whatsapp me uh, personally or you can uh, just uh, join in the uh, our telegram channel if you have any doubt please be uh, feel free to contact me so thank you so much and thank you once again uh, ge team for uh, organizing this wonderful event thank you very much dr anu for giving a very extensive, uh, extensive lecture on the most sorted out topic on ards covid and uh, ards in covid patient Thank you very much, sir. It's very exhaustive, and I think uh, uh, it's, it's packed with information, and it will be really useful for uh, our participants, which will be thoughtful as well as actionable for them. So, so uh, during Dr. Sanush, Dr. Sanush's uh, session, the poll questions were there. We will take the poll questions now. Sir. Okay, okay. Um, coming to the first question, what action you will take if the patient becomes agitated during a spontaneous awakening trial or spontaneous breathing trial option a heavily resedate option b resedate to ras of minus one titrate ras minus one and 
return to previous ventilator settings option d continue with the spontaneous awakening trial and sbt uh, how was the response the majority almost 70 percentage of the participants have voted for option d d right okay um i think uh, that seems to be the most sensible answer because um, we need to return to the previous settings and we need to keep the patient slightly sedated and uh, one more thing during weaning anytime sbt failure you have to check whether it is due to an acute cause like a fever or any uh, painful procedure and all then in that case you can re-attempt sbt later on the same day itself otherwise you attempt on the next day so you um, down titrate the sedation as much as possible okay so this is the practice do do not over sedate just because sbt is failed okay second question pick out the wrong statement regarding copd ventilation management the disease may not have a reversible component yes quantifying dynamic hyperinflation at bedside is very difficult true copd patients may be difficult to wean true the outcome is same as for acute asthma exacerbation patient that is the wrong statement because the background pathophysiology is different asthma it's acute onset and it's almost fully reversible and it comes on and off but uh, copd is a progressive persistent deterioration and uh, you will not come back to the base or the starting point after each exacerbation so with time you are going to get worse only so that's why the outcome cannot be the same how was the response from our audience almost 60 percentage of the participants have voted for choice d sir. yeah okay. they have selected so the right choice are, yeah basically everybody agrees that uh, asthma and copd there are some common things but uh, uh, outcome may not be the same third question which of the following statement or statements are true regarding auto peep low tidal volume decreased respiratory rate yes i have explained with the rationale behind those increase expiratory time because we have to give more time because of the in inadequate emptying of the alveoli addition of extrinsic peep to an extent always helps in the inspiratory effort so uh, to avoid the miss missed breaths and uh, uh, increased work of breathing you always add around 50 to 80 percent of the measured intrinsic peep as extrinsic peep so i think uh, option d all of the above should be the best statement among these how was the response dr prabhu yeah uh, more than 75 percentage of our participants have opted for price days all of the above is what they had selected so the single best response you need to get the best response option a is also correct b is also correct c is also correct so all of the above should be the best option i think then uh, we'll take the remaining uh, questions in the chat also yes sir so we have got few questions uh, for both uh, dr anup and dr sanesh uh, uh, let me take the question so now we will move to the q and a session Uh, there are some questions to uh, repeat certain part of the session. I think we would uh, we would like to uh, redirect the participants. There will be a recorded session which will be made available to all of the registered participants. The link will be provided. You can uh, have a check on that. As well as the recorded session is already available on uh, campus webinar session which is hosted jointly by Dr. Anup and Sanish. It is available in their YouTube channel as well. So, uh, in the interest of the time, of this uh, learning platform, so the repeatability, and uh, you can view it according to your timing. Though live interaction gives a different feel, you can directly interact with the uh, speaker or faculty. Uh, what is the ideal target for static compliance value? Is there any defined value which they should target? Usually we don't uh, target at a compliance, but nowadays, as I've told, with an armato trial, we target at a driving pressure. So even though we, uh, uh, I've already told, like what are the concepts in ARDS ventilation, everything is important, but most important we are giving for the driving pressure nowadays. Obviously, we have to look at uh, the 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 pleural pressure, the uh, uh, like other pressures also. 
but you cannot uh, target a static compliance a particular value and ventilate it is not possible so don't worry about the static compliance this is to give you an idea about the recruitability whether the lengths are getting recruited better with the peep you don't have to target a particular value of uh, compliance thank you sir thank you sir when when should we use an incremental peep trial and when should we use a decremental peep trial is there any recommendation both are uh, equally good i have told there are two methods so when we use is i have already given you two situations suppose we are ventilating a patient with a, a, a starting with a seven peep your oxygenation is low so you gradually increase the peep and see whether the patient oxygenation is getting maintained suppose if you see that a patient who is already on niv other treatment for a, a, a like a more time you have slightly de uh, uh, delayed the intubation where you feel that the lung is more recruitable so in that case if you like do a recruitable maneuver you are already doing with a high peep or a high pressure so that situation you can gradually reduce the peep and see what is the optimal peep other situation you just gradually increase the peep and go for a incremental titration very simple Are there any changes in the mechanics of the alveoli when we are doing an incremental peep where we are actually opening the alveoli whereas uh, on the other side when we are decrementing we already opened it and coming down towards the closing pressure no we are just finding out at what pressure the alveoli are more alveoli are getting opened up so whether you start from a higher pressure or a lower pressure it does, it is immaterial so the the question what is asked is like if you based on your, the the concept in your question every patient should be recruited that is the highest pressure you use and then you come down but clinically when that was compared the evidence for the recruitment is not very strong so we don't have to recruit all patients and come with a, a decremental uh, peep trial we can uh, very well use an incremental peep trial that is the one which we usually uh, do in our pet side but as i have told there are particular group of patients who are definitely going to improve with a recruitment such group of patients definitely you can go with a decremental trial so forget about whether you do an incremental or a decremental this i was just trying to give you two methods the concept of